Hey investor friends, I'm Michelle Markey and let me ask you a question. What is one of your favorite brands whose company stock you have not yet invested in? Because sometimes investing in companies whose brands we know and trust can make really good investments as after watching this video, you'll want to really look into your favorite brand stock because we'll learn from Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors of all time in how to identify businesses to invest in. And some of them may be brands we've grown up with like Disney where many of us remember going to Disneyland and Disney World and watching plenty of Disney movies and it's no surprise that the Disney brand is as strong as ever even though Buffett makes an outdated reference to video stores but you can forgive that because some brands still remain strong for many decades if not sometimes centuries like Disney has and so we'll want to pay attention especially to Warren Buffett's lessons here and if you also enjoy learning from some of the best investors please be sure to like and subscribe and let's listen to Warren Buffett. I mean, investing is putting out money to be sure of getting more money back later, you know, at an appropriate rate. And, and to do that, you have to understand what you're doing it in. I mean, you have to understand the business. And you can understand some businesses, but not all businesses. Yep. Warren, so you covered half of it, which is trying to understand a business and buying a business, but you also alluded to getting a return on the amount of capital you invest in the business as an investor. And, and you know, that comes back to, to what are you paying for the business? How do you determine you know, what you think is a fair price to pay for the business. It's a tough thing to decide, but it, I don't want to buy into any business I'm not terribly sure of. So if I'm terribly sure of it, it probably doesn't, it probably isn't going to offer incredible returns. I mean, why should something that is essentially a cinch to do well offer you 40% a year or something like that? So we, we don't have huge returns in mind, but we do have in mind never losing anything. And I mean, we, we bought C's Candy in 1972. C's Candy was then selling 16 million pounds of candy at $1.95 a pound, and it was making two bits a pound or four million pre-tax. We paid $25 million for it. it. Took no capital to speak of. When we looked at that business, basically my partner Charlie and I really decided whether there was a little untapped pricing power there. In other words, whether that $1.95 box of candy could just as easily sell for two or two and a quarter. If it could sell for two and a quarter, another 30 cents a pound was, was four million eight on 16 million pounds which on a 25 million purchase price was fine. We didn't do any, you know, we, we've never hired a consultant in our lives. We, I mean, we, our idea of consulting is go out and buy a box of candy, you know, <laughs> and eat it. Uh, but what we did know was, there was that they had share of mind in California. I mean, there was something special. Every person in California had something in their mind about C's candy, and overwhelmingly it was favorable. They had taken a box, you know, Valentine's Day and given it to some girl, and she kissed them. If she'd slapped them, you know, we'd have no business. But, but if, as long as she kisses them, you know, that's, that's, that's what we want in their mind. Seize candy, getting kissed. And if we can get that in the minds of people, we can raise prices. And, and I bought that in, <laughs> I bought it in 1972. We've raised, every year I raise the price on December 26th. I raise it the day after Christmas so that everybody, because we sell a lot at Christmas. In fact, we'll make $60 million this year. We'll sell 30 million pounds, make $2 a pound. Same business, same formulas, same everything. 60 million bucks still doesn't take any capital. And we'll make more money 10 years from now. But of that 60 million, we make about 55 million in the three weeks before Christmas. And our company song is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I mean, it is, <laughs> it is a good business. <laughs> but the important thing about that business is that, think about it a little. People don't buy, most people don't buy boxed chocolates to consume themselves. They buy them as gifts, you know, somebody, somebody's birthday. More likely it's a holiday. It's a Valentine's Day, single biggest day of the year. Christmas is the biggest season by far. But women buy for Christmas, and they plan ahead and buy over a two or three week period. Men buy on Valentine's Day. They're driving home. We run ads on the radio, you know, guilt, 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 guilt. You know, the guys are veering off the freeway right and left. And they won't dare go home without a box of candy when we get through with them on our radio ads. So that Valentine's Day is the biggest day. But can you imagine going home on Valentine's Day, and our C's candy is now 11 bucks a pound, thanks to my brilliance. And, uh, and let's say there's, there's candy available at six dollars a pound but do you really want to walk in on Valentine's Day and hand I mean this, your wife's got all these favorable images of the C's candy over the years and she sees you and that's the way she thinks of you during the rest of the year when you really behave kind of badly and you walk in and say honey this year I took the low bid and then hand her a box of candy I mean it just isn't gonna work uh, uh, so in a sense it's, it's not price dependent basically Think of Disney. I mean, Disney is selling, we'll say, home videos for, I don't know, what, $16.95, $18.95, or whatever. All over the world, people, 
and we'll say particularly mothers in this case, have something in their mind about Disney. I mean, every person in this room, when you say Disney, has something in their mind about it. If I say Universal Pictures, you don't have anything in your mind. You know, If I say 20th Century Fox, you don't have anything special in your mind. If I say Disney, you've got something in your mind. And that's true around the world. Now, picture yourself with a couple of young kids, you know, who you want to put away for a couple of hours every day to so get a little peace of mind. And you, and you know if you get them one video, they'll watch it 20 times. So you go to the video store, wherever you buy the video. Are you going to sit there and premiere, you know, 10 different videos and watch them each for an hour and a half to decide which one your kid should watch? No. I mean, let's say there's one there for $16.95 and a Disney's there for $17.95. You know if you take the Disney video, you're going to be okay. So you buy it. And you don't have to make a quality decision on something that you don't want to spend the time to do. And so you can get a little bit more money if you're, if you're Disney. And you'll sell a lot more videos. It makes it a wonderful business. It makes it very tough for the other guy. How would you try to create a brand? DreamWorks is trying, but how would you try to create a brand that competes with Disney around the world and to replace the concept that people have in their minds about Disney with something that says Universal Pictures? You know, so that the mother's going to walk in and pick out a Universal Pictures uh, video in preference to a Disney. It's not going to happen. You know, Coca-Cola is associated with people being happy around the world, where every place they're happy, where Disney World or Disneyland, where the World Cup will be at the Olympics, where every place where people are happy. Happiness and Coke go together. Now, you give me, I don't care how much money, and tell me that I'm going to do that with RC Cola around the world and have five billion people that have a favorable image in their mind about RC Cola, it can't get done. You know, and you can fool around with the, you can do anything you want to do. You know, have price discounts on weekends and everything, but you're not going to touch it. And that's what you want to have in a business. That, that's the moat. And you want that moat to widen. And if you're seized candy, you want to do everything in the world to make sure that the experience basically of giving that gift leads to a favorable reaction. That means, means what's in the box. It means the person that sells it to you because all our business is done when we're terribly busy. I mean, people come in in those weeks before Christmas or on Valentine's Day and they're long lines. So at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, some woman is selling the last person the last box of candy and that person's been waiting in line for maybe 20 or 30 customers. And if the salesperson smiles at that last customer, our moat is widened. And if she snarls at him, our moat is narrowed. We can't see it. It's going on every day. But that's the key to it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a total part of the product delivery is having everything associated with, with it, say, seize candy and something pleasant happening. And that's what business is all about. Yep. The question is, whether have I ever bought a company where the numbers told me not to and how much is qualitative and how much is quantitative? The best buys have been when the numbers almost tell you not to. I mean, because... Then you, then you feel so strongly about the product and not just the fact that you're getting a used cigar but cheap that it, it, it's compelling. I mean, I, I owned a windmill company at one time. So I, I, you know, windmills are cigar butts, believe me. <laughs> and, and I bought it very cheap. I bought it at a third of working capital and we made money out of it. But there's no repetitive money to be earned. I mean, there's a one-time profit in something like that and, and it, it's just not, it's not the thing to be doing. I went through that phase. I mean, I bought streetcar companies and all kinds of things. But, uh, in terms of the qualitative, I probably understand the qualitative the moment I get the phone call. I mean, almost every business we've bought um, has taken five or ten minutes, I mean, in terms of analysis. Uh, and we bought two businesses this year. Uh, General Re is, you know, 18 billion or some deal. I've never been to their home office. Yeah. I hope it's there. <laughs> yeah, there could be just a few guys and they say, well, what, what numbers shall we send Buffett this month? You know, I, just, no, I can see him you know, coming in once a, once a month and saying, well, we'll just tell him we've got $20 billion in the bank this month instead of $18 billion or something. But I've never been there. I've never, I, and before I bought Executive Jet, which is fractional ownership of, 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 of jets, and before I bought it, I'd never been there. I, I bought my family a quarter interest in the program for years earlier, and I'd seen the service and seen it develop well. And I got the numbers, but if you don't know enough to know about the business instantly, you won't know enough in a month or two months. I mean, you have to have sort of the background of, of understanding and, and knowing what you do understand and don't understand. And that, that is the key. It's, it's defining what I call your circle of competence. And everybody's got a different circle of competence. The important thing is not how big the circle is. The important thing is staying inside the circle. And if that circle has only got 30 companies in it out of thousands on the big board, as long as you know which 30 they are, you're okay. And you should know those businesses well enough so that you don't need to read, do lots of work. Now, I, I did a lot of work in the earlier years just in getting familiar with businesses. And, and the way I would do that is I would go out and use what Phil Fisher called the scuttlebutt approach. I'd go out 
I talk to customers. I talk to I talk to to maybe ex employees in some cases. I talk to suppliers. Everybody. Every time I'd see somebody in an industry, let's say I was interested in the coal industry, I go around and see every coal company, and I'd ask every every CEO. If you could only buy stock in one coal company that wasn't your own, which one would it be and why? And you piece those things together and you learn a lot about the business after a while. And the funny thing is you get very similar answers as long as you ask about competitors. And that, uh, you know, I would, I'd say if you got a silver bullet you know, and you put it through the head of one competitor, which competitor and why? You know, you'll find out who the best guy in the industry is that, in, in that case or the one that's coming up. And there's a, so there's a lot of things you can learn about a business. I, I've done that in the past uh, on the businesses that I feel I could understand, so I don't have to do much of that anymore. It's the nice thing about investing is you don't have to learn anything very new. I mean, you can do it if you want to, but if you learned about Wrigley's Chewing Gum 40 years ago, you, you still understand Wrigley's Chewing Gum. It's not, there, there's not a lot of great insights to get or anything of the sort as you go along. So you, you do get a database in your head. I had a guy... Uh, Frank Rooney, who ran Melville for many years, his father-in-law died, owned a company called H.H. Brown, a shoe company. And, and uh, he put it up with Goldman Sachs, but he was playing golf with a friend of mine here in Florida and uh, mentioned to this friend, the guy said, why don't you call Warren? He called me at the end of the golf match, and in five minutes I basically had a deal. And, but I, I knew Frank, and I knew the kind of business. And I sort of knew the basic economics of a shoe business, and so I could buy it. And quantitatively, i got to decide what the price is. Uh, but... Uh, you know, that's either yes or no. I mean, it, I, don't, I don't fool around a lot with negotiations. So if they, if they name a price that makes sense to me, I buy it. And if they don't, I, you know, I was happy the day before, so I'll be happy the day after without owning it. And so the final takeaway is you'll have better results if you only invest in the businesses you're capable of understanding. And the way to go about doing this is by gradually building your knowledge in a few companies and industries you're really interested in and that you feel like you're capable of understanding them. Because if it's a really complex topic and it's really hard to know what the economics are going to be like over the next few years, then maybe it's time to move on to a better company that you think you can get a better grasp on. And that's how you can eventually arrive at fast investing decisions, like how Warren Buffett is able to invest in something in only five to 10 minutes because he's been spending decades and gradually building knowledge in the kinds of companies and industries he knows and understands. And that's really important that we stay within our circle of competence and not go beyond those boundaries because that's where mistakes can be made. And so if you enjoyed this video or learned something, please like and subscribe and here's to only investing in company stocks that we can understand till next time